Hi everyone. In this edition of Hashtag Unplugged, we will be having a panel discussion around the topic on secure and resilient digital citizen services at the front lines. And with me in this panel are three esteemed panelists from the healthcare sector as well as from the cybersecurity sector. So let me introduce them. We have from IHH Healthcare Burhat, Mr. Linus Tum, who's the group CIO. Linus. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Rama, for inviting me to this uh, very nice panel. Uh, glad to meet everyone here. Good. And we also have Leonard Ong, who is the Regional Information Security Officer, APAC, from GE Healthcare. Leonard. Glad to be here, Rama. And last but not least, we have Mr. Alvin Rodriguez, who is the Field Chief Security Officer, APAC, from Infoblox. Alvin. Thank you. It's an honor and privilege to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Good. So maybe I'll ask the uh, first question mm. uh, to you. Uh, I'll post the first question, okay. Linus. Linus, as we all know, the crisis has really disrupted uh, at the government level, at the enterprise level, and even at the individual level, mm. right? And particularly for you in the healthcare services, I'm quite sure the crisis has also transformed mm. medical services in a big way. Yep. Uh, maybe you can uh, describe to us some of the transformation that's taking place and uh, what you have been doing during the crisis. Okay. So let me maybe just say in terms of the major transformations, some of them actually started. It's just that the COVID crisis accelerated a lot of them. Mm -hmm. right. But if we break it down into the different areas of the transformation that has happened, first of which clearly is when all the borders got closed, not just international borders, but even domestic borders between states, mm -hmm. that forced a new model of care delivery. Uh, where in either patients cannot come or are fearful to come or they have a 14-day quarantine before they can come. Mm -hmm. So that forced a new way of looking at engaging, providing care. The other area would be that when even borders started opening up and when some of the lockdowns have uh, stopped, people are fearful mm -hmm. and they're questioning, should I come, don't I come, will I be exposed to the virus if I come? And so that caused us to really look at some of the services we provide. So not just the traditional services are changing, we now need to look at new services. Mm. In, uh, for example, like in India, it's a case of we've us now introduced home care services mm -hmm. where it used to be therapy would be done in the hospitals. Now we introduce it in the home. So that's a new set of services. Right. The other transformation that's kind of happened and it's forced on us in that all the additional requirements due to COVID, the spacing, the uh, safe distancing, mm -hmm. the additional checks, the additional infection uh, protections between consultations, cleaning between consultations, that has actually added a lot of overheads within the setting of care. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. required us to relook at how do we provide care in that setting. With all these added costs stacked up, and most people are now saying that, hey, look, I don't want to pay for it. But mm -hmm. how do you then have that communication? How do you change it? How do you make sure that we change all those things? So those are some of the challenges in these three buckets mm -hmm. that we've actually now needed to relook at the entire care delivery mechanism yeah. and look at where are the areas that technology can help us right. um, and support the transformation of the care process. Right. So it's, right. A, a, mm. it's both a, a technology um, I would say it's a partnership between technology with the operations mm -hmm. and not a necessarily a business-led or technology-led transformation. Right. So that's right. very okay. much how the things we've been changing. Mm -hmm. And it's interestingly, while the challenges are similar, the changes are different by markets because mm -hmm. the cultural differences that we've seen right. in each of our markets where the patients came from, uh, their, their preferences do have uh, an impact to what, mm -hmm. we, what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. for those markets. That's right. So actually, uh, Linus, you've mentioned a couple of things. I'd mm. just like to zero in on the part where you mentioned about technology, right? Mm. So this is where I'm going to ask uh, Leonard, right? So Leonard, uh, as Linus mm. has 
already said that they were leveraging a fair bit on technology. You coming from GE and, you know, emphasis very much on medical technology. Uh, can you share with us uh, how the crisis has in some ways, I mean, uh, Linus used the word accelerated, but I guess uh, we can also use the word uh, contextually modernize the sort of technology that will be relevant, right, for the kind of services that he has to deliver. So, yeah. Lainet. Thank you, Rama. I think uh, the transformation in digital health space has been going on for some time. For example, in the past, when we go to, uh, to take our X-ray or, or CT scan, we mm -hmm. are given a hard copy of the film, right, where we carry all this big envelope to our doctors and so yeah. on. We don't do that anymore. Mm. Now we carry a CD, and now we don't even do CD or thumb drive anymore. Everything is available on the internet. Mm. You can download them, you can give access to your doctors. As you move to different doctors, you can give them access as well. So that has been going on for the past uh, decade. And I think this year what we see is really the way we access healthcare services. Mm. Uh, healthcare is very um, personalized. Mm. You want to see the doctors that you're familiar with. It could be close to your vicinity, it could be restricted because your company insurance requires a certain network, or is this just because of convenience? But now, because of what Linus mentioned, that there's restriction mm. in movement and so on, we really have to move to digital. Mm. Because you don't want to expose yourself into a higher risk by going for simple uh, illness, and uh, mm. you, know, you, you may get uh, exposed to something which is bigger. Yeah. And that, I think, has really exposed uh, uh, the, uh, the need to, to go digital. And mm -hmm. for example, uh, telemedicine. I think that's something which is very um, uh, apparent uh, in, in Singapore mm -hmm. and in many parts of the world. But telemedicine is much more than just uh, speaking to your doctor over mobile phone. Actually, there are a lot of processes behind it. You have to do a filtering question because not all consultations are suitable for mm -hmm. uh, telemedicine. And then when you see a doctor, your medical record has to be available electronically. And that's really... Uh, mm -hmm changing the way uh, the clinics are accessing data from perhaps in the, some clinics still use paper and pen. Now you can't do that anymore. And thirdly, how about your dispensary? So when doctors are prescribing drugs, you want to send the, the, the medicine to your home and there's an additional logistic around it. Mm. So this whole uh, transformation, in fact, is simply just going digital. There are a lot mm. of uh, business process around it. Right. Mm. So, so Leonard, related to what you've just described, mm about providing convenience, you are also playing the role of the information security yeah. officer. And, uh, you know, and we've heard of many cases where during this crisis, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, you know, are being exposed. Uh, can you uh, describe some of the threats that you have heard, especially from your clients? Yeah, uh, we'll be glad to. Probably I will uh, provide two examples and my colleagues mm -hmm. here, uh, my colleague panelists will be able to share more. So, for example, uh, earlier this year, there was a research that was done that a lot of medical images are floating around the internet. And the numbers are astounding. Mm. There are about 1.19 billion images coming from 35, uh, 3.5 million uh, scans. Mm. So that's about four images per scan, mm. right? And that's floating on the internet. And why is that? It's because when we go to transform ourselves digitally and all these medical images are available on, as a picture, mm. as a, uh, it's a standard diacom uh, images. We forgot the, to secure that, mm. right? So sometimes doctors just give the URL mm -hmm. link, and you, you got your CT scan, ultrasound, X-rays. Some uh, did it slightly better, just to protect it with a simple username and password. But they may not do the actual stuff like uh, vulnerability mm. scanning, penetration tests, doing mm -hmm. all the necessary stuff because it is medical. It's not. Yeah. Uh, e-commerce website, it's not the internet banking, so the mindset is there. Mm. But the number is astounding. Um, fortunately, uh, those images are floating around. Right. Uh, it's been checked that none of them is from Singapore, mm -hmm. half of them from the US. Right. Mm. But yeah. it is a good example whereby we transform ourselves, but we've mm -hmm. forgotten to do the basic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we shouldn't do the same mistake when we come to telemedicine and mm -hmm. assessing the use of IOTs and so on for acute uh, treatment and so on. Right. Yeah. So thank you very much, Leonard, for sharing with us uh, some of the vulnerabilities uh, associated with some of the conveniences that you're providing, right, from a medical technology point of view. So this is when I'm going to ask uh, Elvin. Elvin, mm. you come from the cybersecurity uh, tech sector, and I'm, I'm quite sure what uh, 
Leonard has shared is not nothing new. Mm. And you may have even heard about more tracks. Yes. Mm. So, so what is Infoblox, the company in which you are, you are working with, has done to mitigate some of the threats that you've heard so far? Well, actually, before even going down the Infoblox route, yeah. um, like any cybersecurity practitioner, what we need to do is understand your business process. How are you actually um, delivering that medical service? You know, is it telemedicine or is it on-prem through a clinic whereby you have the additional processes like, you know, what Leonard was described or what Linus has also described. Mm. Um, understanding that and then the next thing we need to look at is in that workflow, where is the you know, flow of data? How is it, you know, traversing mm. across all this and who has access to that? Mm. Once we have clarity of that, it becomes easier to look at and identify um, what are the points of vulnerabilities in that workflow? Mm. Because it's not just putting a solution there, it's contextualizing the solution against the business mm. landscape, against right. the operation landscape, mm. that makes it valuable, that makes it meaningful. Mm. And we all know that in today's environment, um, hackers are very, very interested in patient records for the very simple reason that um, financial information that they once was interested um, in is now easy to change. If my account, my credit card information is being compromised, all I need to do is just give the bank a call and in less than five minutes, that 16-digit um, associated with me will be nullified. Mm. You know? But if I have high blood pressure, mm. or if I have AIDS, for example, mm. Mm. and that information gets out, right? Um, the hacker can come back to me and blackmail me. Do you want people to know that you have AIDS? Public embarrassment. Do I want that? Mm. No, I don't. So I get subjected to that. Or um, share with my other family members that I may have a chronic disease, for example, and tell them that, did you know that he's going this treatment and he doesn't have enough money and I'm here to help? So social engineering, impersonation, all can come into the picture. Right. Over still, spam me with a lot of emails telling me about this drug that has um, a cure for the ailments mm -hmm. that I have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's from, a use, end use, that's from an individual standpoint. From a company standpoint, what we find is that hospitals, clinics, um, all those what I would like to call custodians and stewards of our patient records um, want two things. Number one, they want to avoid disruption to medical services. Mm -hmm. Number two, they want to protect patient records, mm -hmm. right? So just hold that thought for a while. Mm -hmm. This is where I want to ask Linus, sure. right? So Linus, what Elvin has shared, mm -hmm. uh, I would say poses a big challenge for you. Why mm -hmm. I say that is because uh, when you're looking from a healthcare services point mm -hmm. of view, there are so many touch points, yep. right? As Elvin has said, you know, from the financial information point mm. of view, and then you have the patient records, yep. and then not to forget, like what Leonard said, mm. from the medical equipment yeah. which you're using. I mean, all these will probably be covered as part of your governance, mm -hmm. part of your education process. So share with us uh, what goes on, you know, as you manage mm. this, right, within the hospitals, and now even at remote sites, mm -hmm. uh, what is the sort of thought process that goes through, you know, mm -hmm. with the kind of work that you're doing? So I, I would say it's a case of now doing everything that we were doing mm -hmm. a lot faster, yeah. a lot more intensely, more intense, yeah. and, and also at the same time uh, needing to be a lot more agile mm. and uh, dynamic. Yeah. Because Resilience and all that the, comes the into The fact of the matter is they yeah. change Right. The, the attack vectors change so right. frequently. Yes, the yes. exposures change so quickly. Mm. And, and we've just got to uh, adapt quickly. Yes. One of the, the, the lessons we've learned over the uh, uh, few past couple of years was that whatever we put in place just uh, or plan to put in place, because mm. it takes time to roll it out to such right. a huge network. That's right. um, even, even whatever we've decided there, it, it almost like there's a new thing that comes up that mm. kind of renders it almost impotent. Uh, before you're done implementing it. Right. So how do you keep yeah. adjusting for it? Right. And, and so I guess one of the, our approaches so far, we've, we've taken a slightly different approach now to say that um, no, uh, in the past, healthcare tended to outsource mm. a, a lot. At least right. for us, we tended to outsource. Partly, I guess, because cybersecurity experts are so few and far in between. And um, banks, insurance companies, and followed by governments, <laughs> are very good at hiring them all up. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly in Singapore, after right. the Sing Health incident. <laughs> yeah. So we just can't beat them right. in getting people. So mm. we used to just outsource yeah. the problem mm. uh, and, and, and leave it to a, a, a vendor. So in, I guess in a way, Sing Health was a blessing for, for some of us who didn't get hit. Yeah. yeah. In that 
it kind of woke us up to say you cannot you can outsource mm. but you cannot abdicate the responsibility right. so we decided yep. no we're gonna like it or not we will build up the capability internally mm. Mm. which we have started doing yeah and we've then also look out and then started sourcing right and we decided we're going to architect the capability oh, ourselves yeah. okay and source for partners who will fit into the architecture mm. with the necessary scalability, flexibility, and all that that right. we want. So okay. it's a bit of a, 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 a moving into a hybrid. We're not going to try to build everything internally. That's right. impossible. Right. Right. And, and yeah. certainly the technology, the tools, and all that out there, uh, we're not going to try to reinvent all those. Right. But we now need to make sure that we pick the right ones. Uh, we understand them well enough to know what we're going to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, where, because when you outsource, the partner you outsource to will pick everything that they are right. familiar with that's or right. they have a strong partnership with. Yep. But then that's the limit of what you can get. Mm -hmm. If something new comes along, someone will say that you are missing this in your repertoire. You need to add it in. Mm -hmm. The problem then is that we could end up adding a lot of things that overlap, yeah. wherein that translates to unnecessary costs. Mm -hmm. But my bigger worry is worse. You add, 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 mm, mm. and you end up having gaps in between despite all the things that you have added. That's true. Yeah. Then when you get a breach, just in that little gap, which every That's one of right. these hackers are very yep. good at exploiting, yep. yes. yeah. then the ball will come around and say, you know you spent mm. all that money. Why are you still getting attacked? You <laughs> promised true. me you got yep. all this done. Yeah. I, also, I, 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 some time back when, when mm -hmm. my boss uh, told me, <laughs> um, can you guarantee me if you did all this that yeah. you won't get... <laughs> Uh, an attack. Right. I told him I'll do everything possible to prevent a preventable attack, yep. but I will not guarantee it to you. I thought he was, he was almost ready to fire me on the spot. <laughs> yeah. So I told yeah. him, I said, if yeah. I guarantee you, I'm lying. Yeah. Yes. I can't guarantee that. Right. So, so that's the situation. So okay. we're trying to respond that way. Right. But I'd just like to add on to one point that you mm. said. I think right now what's happened is that we are paying a lot of attention uh, because heightened by COVID, Mm. There's a lot more attacks, a lot mm. more phishing exercises. Right, yes. We've been monitoring, we're seeing huge right. spikes in phishing yep. and, and, and spam and, and, and even attempts to break in. Mm. Huge mm. spikes in that. But these are actually malicious actors. The problem is we've now somehow maybe taken the eye off a little bit because mm. of all this attention on the weakest link, yeah. which is actually the end user. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Humans, huh? humans. With the... Yeah. Ex with the increasing digital transformation, mm. the end user is no longer our doctors and nurses. Mm. The end user is the patient That's who right. participates digitally with us. And for all you know, yeah. a lot of those x-ray images that you mentioned mm. Mm. may well be a patient um, kind of like, just innocently, I got <laughs> this x-ray or MRI on a CD, I'm sending it to my father for him to have a look at it on an unencrypted email channel. Mm. Or yeah. I load it into Dropbox, mm. uh, personal Dropbox, which is not exactly the most right. secure environment where right. you want to load a file. And, and, and that's how it's yeah. exposed. Right. right? So, so that, in, in my mind, it, it may well be eventually yeah. one of the weak links uh, in this whole ecosystem. We can tighten everything in our environment, put policies in place, put tools, put mechanisms to protect. But we can't take over our patients' mobile phones and PCs. Hmm. Neither would they allow us to. Yeah, true. That's right. right. So, so that's something which I, I don't know. Maybe you okay. can you can talk to that as well. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, as uh, the whole ecosystem. Mm. No, you're, you're spot on on that. Yeah. Um, when you think about the value chain, when you think about you know the entire user interaction, you need to think about it holistically. Mm. From the producer, um, the content curator, mm. or the, the the producer, the deliverer, and then the consumer, mm. right? You need to think about what role they play in every stage, and then how do you secure that entire environment? Mm. You know, maybe for example, you know, a better understanding of how would the user, the the consumer, use the information. Mm. To your point, I want to share with my father mm. or my grandfather this X-ray that I have. Maybe the right approach would be, you know, for the hospital to actually give, who has given them that as a digital format, to then give a time-based limit mm. to share this with your parent, and after that, you know, it's no longer accessible. Mm. For example. So understanding how that information is consumed becomes really, really important. Mm. And these are just some of the ways that I think companies need to take a more earnest approach mm. towards uh, managing security of the data mm. that they are somewhat responsible for, although the ownership of the data belongs to someone else because mm. they are the custodians yeah. and the curators of the data. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think you brought up a very valid point and Linus as well. Uh, if you think about uh, digital transformation healthcare, mm -hmm. right? There are a couple of uh, there's a different track mm. because if we unpack healthcare, 
Yeah, actually, there are three sectors. One is the, uh, ph the pharmaceutical. Yeah. You've got the medical services and you also the medical technology equipment, right? right? So you've got these three. Mm -hmm. The challenges is quite different. In medical services, the problem is that a lot of clinics are still running on uh, old CMS, mm -hmm. clinical management system. That's right. yep. When I say old, it is from a security point of view, definitely there are a lot of vulnerabilities mm -hmm. there. And they don't bother probably to improve uh, because it's still working. But mm. then it was the risk level may be a bit low because of an enclosed manner. Mm. But when you go on a, on a telemedicine and you go you link up with uh, mm. all the different mm. uh, external partners, then you actually increase the, the yeah. risk no, of your existing yeah. system. Yep. So the crown jewel of the medical healthcare services is really the CMS. Right. And coming to the complexity, right, the uh, intention of having a national electronic record, medical record, mm. whereby a patient could go one doctor's, mm -hmm. they can bring their data as part of the PDPA as well, right? Mm -hmm. You have the right of your data, you have a portability of your data, and you can mm -hmm. see other healthcare professionals. Yeah. And that's something which is difficult because all CMS are not the same. Mm -hmm. They are not on the universal format and so on. And likewise, uh, because of MNA, we, we mm -hmm. spoke about MNA, right? If you have a different clinic, you've been visiting different clinics, there are a lot of data duplication, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in, in some instances that I've seen, if you visited a different clinic on the same group, 10 times, you may have a different 10 uh, identifier for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like the one person is identified yeah, as 10 yeah. person, right? So that's really one on the healthcare side. On the medical equipment, I think it's more on the, uh, more on the OT side, operational technology. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these technologies, are, they have a very long life cycle, mm -hmm. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, like MRI machine yeah. and so on. Yeah. And there are a lot of limitations. I mean, you can't just install the latest uh, security controls or security mm -hmm. software to protect that because of the long life, life cycle, mm. but yet they still are operating and they are needed as an integral part to provide yes. medical service. Yep. And because of that, on the medical technology point of view, right, we really have to treat it as an OT. Mm. And sometimes uh, a lot of security are done on the enterprise side, right. but not so much on the uh, medical side. technology yep, right. side. Mm. Right. So it has to be, uh, we have to look at holistically what, as yeah. you mentioned, and the way to do it is slightly different. And that's okay. something sometimes we don't really uh, remember yeah. that they are different. Thank you, thank you. So gentlemen, it was really a very interesting discussion. I think you all did justice to the topic about delivering mm. secured and resilient digital services in the healthcare sector. So, and I think we managed to peel the layers. Mm. I just wish that we had more time, mm. but thank you very much for your views and your insights. Thank you everyone for watching this series of Hashtag Unplug, another interesting discussion. See you soon.